The term eco-psychology, first coined by Theodore Rozak in his 1992 book The Voice of the Earth, it is the study of the relationship that exists between human beings and the natural world. Eco-psychology is a relatively new field that investigates and develops our understanding of the emotional connection between the human psyche and the natural world as a means for individuals to evolve sustainable lifestyles and reconnect with nature. Carl Jung wrote, As scientific understanding has grown, so our world has become dehumanised. Man feels himself isolated in the cosmos because he is no longer involved with nature and has lost his emotional, unconscious identity with natural phenomena. These have slowly lost their symbolic implications. No voice now speak to man from stones, plants and animals, nor does he speak to them believing they can hear. His contact with nature has gone, and with it has gone the profound emotional energy that this symbolic connection supplied. Jung characterises the ethos of eco-psychology here. It is the intellectual breakdown and analysis of the false psychological dualistic divide between the human world and the natural world. Earth is a community that is populated by an innumerable variety of species. Trees, grasses, flowers, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, fish, birds and so on make up all the tapestry of life on Earth. We are an equal member of Earth's community. The Earth is here to provide abundance and prosperity for all species. This is not how humans see the Earth. We abuse and exploit the land and seas for all it's worth because we see the Earth as its resources, as a commodity, something to own and dominate. We don't perceive the tapestry in Earth's community in a natural way, and thus we lose our connection to it and we lose our love for that community. We systematically pillage the earth for its resources without really thinking about the implications for the community as a whole. We destroy habitats and push species to extinction in pursuit of profit and infinite economic growth to sustain our consumerist society, which always wants more. This is the view that eco-psychology takes. It contends that we take the ecological perspective that we are an animal one of many species that calls Earth home, and not merely an exploiter of the land and resources, then we may learn to appreciate the natural world as a social and psychological field, like we do with the human community. One of the core principles of eco-psychology is that the deep structures of the human brain evolved in a world much different from which it resides in today, a world governed by a more than human natural order, as opposed to our urban social modern world. Biologist E. O. Wilson suggested in his Biophilia Hypothesis that human beings have an innate instinct to emotionally connect with nature, particularly aspects of nature that recall what evolutionary psychologists have termed the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness, in other words, the natural conditions that the human species evolved to inhabit. The field of eco-psychology extends beyond the conventional purview of psychology, which has traditionally considered the psyche to be a matter of relevance to humans alone. Eco-psychology examines why people continue environmentally damaging behaviour and tries to develop methods of positive motivation for adopting of sustainable practices. Evidence suggests that many environmentally damaging behaviours are addictive at some level and thus are more effectively addressed through positive emotional fulfilment rather than by inflicting shame. Eco-psychology implies there is no real separation on the human psyche. The experience of in here and the natural world, the experience of out there, Eco-psychologists advocate that the human mind can't really be known or understood as a distinct entity that exists in discrete dimension, segregated from a central world that corporeally surrounds us. Indeed, we cannot understand the natural world around us intimately if we see the Earth as nothing more than a composite of objects and inanimate processes devoid of its own psyche and sentience. And in a sentence, eco-psychology tells us that we too are nature. In his 2013 book, Radical Eco-Psychology, Andy Fisher suggests three tasks for eco-psychologists to undertake to further develop the field. These are the psychological task, the philosophical task, and the practical task. The psychological task is to acknowledge and better understand the human nature relationship as a relationship. 
In other words, the psychological tasks aims to expand the study of psychology to include consequential relationships with the natural world, as opposed to just human relationships. This task wants to develop our psychological understanding so that it includes all matters of human psychology and spirituality as part of a larger natural order. It wants to comprehend our mental existence under a more than human lens. The philosophical task is to place psyche and soul back into the natural world, because a dead and soulless world offers no intimacy. We have, especially in the West, put all of the soul into human beings, and by doing so have superfluously magnified the importance of the human psyche, and because of this, all significant relationships and connections inordinately fall upon the other human, human relations. We must give the world soul before we can form an intimate relationship with it. The practical task is to develop therapeutic and recollective practices towards an ecological society. Theodore Rosick said in his book, The Voice of the Earth, that environmentalists are the most psychologically illiterate people you will ever meet. They work from a narrow range of motivations, the statistics of impending disaster, the coercive emotional forces of fear and guilt. They overlook the unreason, the perversity, the sick desires that lie at the core of the psyche. Their strategy is to shock and shame. That is to say that environmentalists and scientists bombard climate change deniers with reason, facts and statistics, and then shame and demean people who do not agree without ever thinking as to why. Jonah Macy said that this approach by itself can increase resistance, deepening the sense of apathy and powerlessness. Therapeutic practices are those that attempt to understand the emotional and spiritual conditions underlying the current ecological crisis. Many people in the 21st century feel isolated and disempowered, where the future seems to be unjust and hopeless. The task here is to design supportive measures to help people find where they belong in life and get them to be involved in creating a life-centred society. On the other hand, the recollective practices want to bring us back and get us to understand how the human psyche is fundamentally part of and nurtured by the larger psyche of nature, to relearn the art of venerating nature, giving back to and sustaining mutual relations with a world filled with soul. One example of this is the Vision Quest, long practiced by Native Americans, a quest where one spends a number of days in solitude with nature, fasting in order to gain guidance and spiritual restitution through intimately connecting with the elements of nature. Human beings view the world anthropocentrically. We build our society and alter the world around us according to the needs and desires of human beings. We do this because we see ourselves as superior and more valuable beings than the others that inhabit the natural world. Eco-psychology is trying to change this anthropocentric view of the world to a more ecocentric one. Ecocentrism is the view that humans are part of nature as a whole. It is a holistic model of nature made in incalculable components of which we are one. We are part of an intimate matrix of life in such a way that we cannot exist independently of the whole and we cannot be understood comprehensively without reference to the whole. And the whole is gestalt. It is perceived as more than the sum of its parts.